if you have your Bibles this evening, as we continue our study and building below the baseline, working on those things that just you and God see in your life, we'll be in Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, and we're going to read verses 15 through 21. Speaking about in our next topic, being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter number 5, beginning there at verse number 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another in the fear of God. We thank you again, dear Lord, for your word and pray you will bless our time tonight in your word. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Warren and Pam Adams live in the city of Gilchrist, Texas. In 2005, when Hurricane Rita swept through southeast Texas, it destroyed their home. So when they rebuilt, they reinforced the foundation heavily. 14-foot support beams were installed to lift up the house 24 feet above normal sea level in the event of another storm surge. Less than three years later, Hurricane Ike hit southeastern Texas in 2008. Everything within miles of the Adams was flattened, except the Adams home. It stood intact amidst the destruction, a witness of the importance of what has been built below the baseline. The foundation is vital and important. The Adams family prepared in ways that others did not. They chose to build their foundation deeper than the families around them. And no doubt, there were expenses involved in that those around them did not incur. But when the storm came, It made all the difference to them. In this lesson, we want to learn about another aspect of the Christian life that others don't see, but it makes a tremendous difference. And that is being filled with or being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, it goes against our nature to have someone or something have control of our lives. We have an innate desire to control our own lives and our own destiny. When my wife drives the car, especially when we go on longer trips, she'll use the cruise control. I won't. I use my foot and I keep my foot on that accelerator. Why do I do that? Because I believe I have control. That's why. If I use the cruise control, then the cruise control has control, and I do not. We tend to be that way in our life. We tend to don't like people to tell us what we should do and what we should not do, to be able to have people give us advice on certain things in life because we want to control our own lives and our own destinies. I sink and swim based on what I decide to do. How many people get in trouble that way? How many people are always in trouble because they always do that? And yet we don't always have control over our circumstances in life, do we? When you come to think about things, how much control do we have? 
in our life? And the question is very little, if any, is the answer to that question. You know, I would have liked to have a sunshiny day today. That would have been nice, but I don't have any control over that. God does. In fact, when you come to look at the matter in our lives, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, whatever the case may be, God has control over most everything. And we have control over very little, if not nothing, in life. About the only thing we do have control over is the choices that we make in life. Often storms and troubles will come our way that we wish we could stop. But we have no control to stop. It is in these points of our life that it will be revealed whether or not we have been building lives yielded to the Holy Spirit below the baseline. They always say that, you know, hard times builds character. And that's true. It can. But hard times and storms of life reveal character more than they build it. At the moment of salvation, the Bible says, in Ephes- back in Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 13 and 14, when we come to know Christ as our personal Savior, and we receive the Lord's salvation... We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, there in verses 13 and 14, the Bible tells us there, "...in whom ye also trusted," speaking of Christ, "...after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When we came to know Christ as our personal Savior, God put his seal upon our heart and life through the Holy Spirit of God. Like the old seals that they would have in wax on letters back in the Middle Ages and those times. That's the kind of seal that is being talked about here. God has put his stamp and his mark on our life when we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And in verse 14, it says there, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The indwelling Holy Spirit of God and being sealed by that Holy Spirit of God to identify us as the Lord's is a down payment of the inheritance that the Lord has for us. The earnest. When I bought a house, I had to put $500 down. It was non-refundable. The reason why I had to put that $500 down is because they wanted to know I was serious about buying that house. And that I meant buying that house. So I was going to put some skin in the game, if you will. Because, you know, $500 is $500. (laughs) That's still a lot of money. (laughs) It was an earnest. A down payment toward that house. The Lord has given us his spirit, and his spirit indwells our life as a down payment of what he has for us to come. The inheritance that we will inherit one day when we go home to be with the Lord. And if that's just a down payment, man, what will the inheritance be like? And although we are given, we are, we are given the Holy Spirit at salvation by God, And the Holy Spirit never leaves us, and the Holy Spirit never leaves us. We will have the Spirit of God in us for all eternity as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We must make decisions to surrender to the Holy Spirit of God on an ongoing basis. We need to choose to surrender to the Holy Spirit of God and His control every single day of our life. And this is what it means to live a spirit-filled life. In our text that we read in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21, this teaches us how this looks, this spirit-filled life looks as we live our life every day. And the first thing that we see there is a spirit-filled path. The spirit-filled life isn't just accomplished at a moment of decision. 
When I accept Christ as my personal Savior, I am now on and walking a spirit-filled path. No. It's a, it is a path which we choose to continue to follow each and every day. It is comprised of choices made throughout our days. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The word there, walk there, refers to the way one conducts their daily living. It refers to one's lifestyle, how they live. If we live in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. God wants us to be able to walk in his spirit as opposed to walking after our flesh. And the text here gives us two descriptions of this path, this spirit-filled path. In verses 15 and 16, it talks about it being a path of caution. It says there, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The spirit-filled path is living our lives circumspectly. That's a word you use every day, right? At least twice. This is, not one, this is not a word that we use in our daily conversation, but it is related to a word that we do use, and that's the word circumference. It refers to the entire perimeter or being alert and cautious in every direction. That's what it means to walk circumspectly. You're walking circumspectly, you're looking over your shoulder. You're looking to the left. You're looking to the right. You know what's going on in front of you. You know what's going on behind you. And that is what it means to be able to walk circumspectly. And a person who is walking circumspectly is less likely to be able to stumble. Not only physically, but also spiritually. Because sometimes we stumble at temptation, don't we? We stumble over the stumbling box that Satan puts in our path, and we fall. But if we are controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, if we are walking in the Spirit, and we are being circumspect in our walk, the Lord will point out the stumbling blocks that are there. The temptations that come. The Lord with the temptations in our life, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, makes a way for us to escape that we may be able to bear through those temptations of life. And we're less likely to fall and stumble if we're cautious. And are able to walk circumspectly. In Colossians chapter 4 and in verse number 5. The book of Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. The Bible says there and instructs us there that we are to walk in wisdom. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without toward them that are without, excuse me, redeeming the time. We ought to live our lives as believers in Christ with the awareness that a spiritual hurricane could come at any time. God wants us to be prepared for these storms by walking cautiously, circumspectly, And after all, we have a very real enemy lurking nearby us all the time. And he's always seeking opportunity to devour us. That enemy, of course, is our enemy, Satan. That Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8, where he says there, be sober, 
Be vigilant. For your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. To be vigilant is similar to being circumspect. It means watchful, attentive to discover and avoid danger or to provide for safety. We've all seen lions and pictures of lions and maybe seen lions in a zoo or, you know, a wildlife animal park. They are majestic creatures. They really are. And if we knew we would encounter a lion sometime during our daily routine, we would walk cautiously, wouldn't we? If we knew there was a good chance a lion would come our way, we'd be on the lookout for him. A lion's favorite meal is an antelope. They love a good antelope. And two things help a lion as it hunts for its next meal. They are incredibly good at hiding. And they are phenomenally patient. But there's another advantage to the lion when hunting antelope. Antelopes, while physically fast, are not mentally sharp. And they do not learn from their past mistakes. Though an antelope may have been killed out of a herd just hours before, that same group of antelope will return to the same watering hole. where that lion is probably still there waiting for their next opportunity for lunch or dinner. See, the devil is just like this. He's extremely good at hiding, and he's phenomenally patient. He is not going to advertise that he is a hiding among the bushes. Satan is out there. We know that Satan is out there. We should realize that Satan is out there. But do we ever see him? Usually not until it's too late. Because he's great at hiding. He's not advertising his presence. And we tend to be like these antelopes. Though we have seen the demise of others who disregard God's word and fall into the traps of temptation and fall into the traps of sin, we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. I believe that's the definition of insanity. See, we ought to be always on the lookout for the disguise of the enemy, for the trap that lurks behind a seemingly innocent matter. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And we live in evil days. Satan's lurking. He's always around. We must be on the lookout. Not only do we find a path of caution, but we find a path of consecration. In verse 17 of our text in Ephesians 5, in verse 17, the Bible tells us there, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Spirit-filled path is living a life of Consecration. The word consecration means separating from a common to a sacred use. Isn't that what the Lord has done with us when he saved our soul? He saved our soul from the common sin. Separated us from that sin. That we may be used of him. 
a sacred purpose. It is the, it is the will of the Lord that we live such consecrated and sanctified lives as believers in Christ. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4, there are actually very few places in the Word of God where it says this is the will of God. I read one this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And here we have another example in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. It is God's will that we possess purity from sin in our life. As we talked about when we, took, we, when we looked at the previous lesson in Romans chapter 6, and dying to self. This is our sanctification or our consecration of the Spirit-filled path. We live in a world that promotes living as close to the edge of sin as possible. And even encourages you to cross the line, often. But God tells us to get far away from the danger. God tells us to know how to keep our vessels under control. So we don't give in to the lusts of our heart. In order to be able to do that, boundaries need to be set. And they need to be kept. We have to make personal boundaries in our life for us. And then keep those boundaries in our life. Sometimes we need someone to help keep us accountable in those boundaries for our life. That's where good friends, good Christian friends, and good mentors, and people you can talk to about these things and areas of life can be a great help to you. A pastor can help you to be accountable. And help to hold you accountable. And when you fall, encourage you. That's not the end of the world. You failed today. But set that boundary again. Because you may succeed tomorrow. And days thereafter. And you may succeed more days than you fail. Oh, isn't that a great thing? But boundaries need to be set and decisions need to be made and those de decisions need to be enforced. Just as you would do for your children when you raised children or are raising children, you set boundaries for them. There are consequences if they cross those boundaries. You set those boundaries for their good. You know, my parents told me not to go, you know, not to go play in the road. There was a reason why a car might hit me. It's for my safety. Walk both ways before you cross the street. My parents told me that because that was for my safety. You know, that bus may come by. You never know when that bus is going to show up. Parents set boundaries for their children. In God's word, God sets boundaries for us. And the boundaries that we set for our life must be based on the boundaries that God sets for our life. And therefore, we can live that consecrated life if we keep within the boundaries and make as we tell children, the right decisions. 
If we are going to, if we are going to be for sanctification and honor in our lives as believers, we have to be against everything that hinders our testimony or pulls us away from consecrated living. How do we understand the will of God as it relates to consecration? By the word that God gives us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, in the first part of that verse, it says there, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's why I encourage people to read the Bible. Encourage people to study the Bible. Encourage people to hide God's word in their heart. To memorize the scriptures. Because I tell you, I don't carry my Bible around every day. And, you know, Satan may throw a temptation at me just, you know, just that quick. So I need something to combat that temptation just that quick. And what better way to combat temptation in my life than the same way Jesus combated temptation against Satan in the wilderness? Through the word of God. It is written. And you know, Jesus didn't have you know, an Old Testament scrolls that he had there out in, the, out in the wilderness to be able to open up and to be able to find the verses. They were right there ready for him. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Turn these stones into bread. Satan tempted him. It's important for us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, overflowingly. So that when the temptations come in our life, when the difficulties come in our life, we've got the ammunition right there at our disposal. As J. Oswald Sanders once said, a walk in the spirit will of necessity be a walk in accordance with the word the Spirit has inspired. No one can be filled with the Spirit of God if he is neglecting the word of God. And how true that is. The Spirit-filled path is completely different than the carnal and worldly path. It's a path of walking circumspectly, staying away from danger, not hanging out at the mall of sin, which we shouldn't hang out at. Sometimes, sometimes we have ourselves to blame when we fall, when we are tempted and fall into sin because we've put ourselves in a situation where we are easily tempted. If you're walking circumspectly, you're not putting yourself in those situations. If something that you see tempts you to sin, you turn, the, you turn that off or you turn that channel and you do it right away. If something you read tempts you to sin, you put it down and you walk away from it. You don't linger. The problem is, when we fall into temptation is we put ourselves there and we linger. We do our window shopping. Shouldn't be hanging out where sin is. We need to go. Stay away from it. As much as we can. The spirit-filled path is a path of consecration set apart from common to sacred use. God has something special for all of us. And we need to be able to desire what God has for us that's special. And rather than walking in the common Ways of sin. 
let's swim upstream. It's harder to do. I understand that. But it's more rewarding as we do. So we live our life and live our faith for the Lord Jesus Christ.